Welcome to the Audacity to Podcast, episode 153, nine ways to take podcasting seriously. Thank you for joining me for the Audacity to Podcast. I'm Daniel J. Lewis, and this is the award-winning how-to podcast about podcasting and using Audacity. It's where I give you the guts and teach you the tools to podcast with passion, organization, and dialogue. And this episode has a special sponsor, Dropcam, over at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash dropcam. That's D-R-O-P-C-A-M. I'll tell you more about them in a little bit and how I think you might love it as a podcaster. But in last episode, I talked about seven ways to make podcasting fun. It was a very fun episode. If you haven't looked at the show notes, check them out at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash 152. And there's a very fun image there that I found from iStock Photo. But this time... I'm taking the flip side of this, how to take podcasting seriously. And I actually have more points on this because this is something I think more podcasters need to do is take their podcast seriously when they have these serious goals, because many podcasters will want their podcast to start generating money. They want to grow their audience. They want to strengthen their authority. Even if it's just a hobby podcast, these are things that podcasters often want. And I'm sure that you would love for your podcast to make money for you, you'd love to grow your audience and you'd love to strengthen your authority. Maybe you have different priorities in those things, but they're probably something that you wouldn't mind having a little extra money or bigger audience, any of this, while you're doing your podcast. And I want you to learn how to podcast like you mean it, not just this is the thing you do every now and then, but really mean it. So I've got nine ways for you to take podcasting seriously. Number one, plan. Number two, be consistent. Number three, make contracts. Number four, treat your podcast like a job or business. Number five, invest in your show. Number six, speak with authority. Number seven, delegate what you don't do best. Number eight, change your vocabulary. And number nine, never stop improving. So let's go through this. Number one, plan. This is so important. And I see podcasts that launch and they have no plan of action, no actual idea of where they want to go with their podcast, what they want their podcast to be. Someone once said that failing to plan is planning to fail. And that happens with a podcast, whether you're talking about just an individual episode or the podcast as a whole. Look in iTunes and you'll find many podcasts in there that have one episode or maybe have three episodes or six episodes. Those are podcasts that I'm sure if you were to ask the people, why didn't you do more? They'll probably say, oh, I didn't get around to it or I, I just decided to change my mind or these things where it becomes clear that they didn't really have a plan, an actionable plan, not just Step one, start podcast. Step two, retire from income. <laughs> no, an actual plan of where you want to go. And the plan is not where you want to go, but how you're going to get there. That's your plan. Actual actions. If you have a plan or if you have a goal of doubling your podcast audience, what is your plan to get there? You can't just set that as a goal and hope it happens. You have to make it happen. So I see that there are three levels of planning that should go into your podcast. Number one is plan the kind of show you want it to be. What do you want your podcast to be known for? What do you want to cover in your podcast? How do you plan to cover this overall? What's going to be your unique perspective on this, especially if there's competition in your field that you want to cover? What are you going to bring to the conversation that others aren't? What unique perspective do you have? What will be how you will say this that will be different from everyone else and maybe make you better than others or give a different flavor than others? Number two, plan each episode. I recommend that you don't script your episodes, but you should have some kind of outline to know what you want to cover and also to help you with those transitions from one point to the other. This doesn't have to be every single point that you'll make in your episode, but at least your overarching points, like maybe your three things that you're going to bring out and the three things you want your audience to 
get from your episode. So plan your episode. And number three, plan to meet your goals. So when you know what kind of podcast you want to have, you know what kind of episodes each episode will be, then your goals are the things that you want to do. It could be some big dream you have. Maybe you want your podcast to get a big sponsor, or you want this to make new speaking opportunities for you, bring in new business, grow your audience, whatever it could be, make a plan for how to reach that goal. And if you don't have goals for your podcast, then you better make some because you won't find success if you don't have goals. But the more important part of just having goals is having a plan to meet those goals. If you want a sponsor, how are you going to prepare for your sponsor? Have a, have a goal of the sponsorship and have a plan to reach that goal or whatever your goals are. Make plans for those things. So that's number one way to take podcasting seriously, plan. Number two, be consistent. We throw around this word consistency a lot, and it really is key in building an audience and becoming successful because if you're publishing just a podcast episode when you get around to it, well, how often does that happen? You have to make the time for your podcast. You can't just wait for the time to present itself, but you need to proactively make that time. And I talked about several ways that you could make time for podcasting in episode 144 that you can jump over to that with the links that you're familiar with or look at the show notes for this episode at the slash 153. The best way I think of to be consistent is to write it into your schedule and don't change it. Make it a hard appointment that you can't fit something else into it. So regardless of what's on TV, regardless of what's going on with your phone or sports game or whatever, make this something that you schedule and you will meet that schedule. Of course, you might need some flexibility. Sure. Well, if you need that flexibility, then make time somewhere else for it. If it takes you an hour and you plan for an hour and suddenly there's an emergency. Emergencies come up, sure. Sometimes other more important things come up, sure. But then take that hour and put it somewhere else in the week as soon as you can so you, that you still have that time specifically set aside. Scheduling your time like that will be, I think, the number one way to help you be consistent because you know that this time is when you need to be working on the podcast and releasing your episode. So this time that you allot for yourself is how much time you have to do all of these things and put out your episode as quickly as you can. Be consistent. Look at the podcasters who aren't taking things seriously, and you'll see an episode comes out maybe once every other week. Sometimes it's once a month. Sometimes they forget to put out an episode, so they do a double episode where they combine episodes together just in order to get it out there. Sometimes they'll record the episode and they don't actually publish it for weeks later. And the information, the timely information they share in the episode is no longer timely. It's past its date and then it looks bad on you. All of this kind of stuff, which by the way, you might want to consider being more timeless in your episodes. But this kind of stuff makes it so much harder to be consistent or for, to, to build your audience by not being consistent. So that's number two, be consistent consistent. Do what it takes to release your episodes on a consistent schedule. Number three, make contracts. Now, big disclaimer here. I am not a lawyer and I do recommend that you possibly have a lawyer look over your contracts or even write your contracts for you. But before you get afraid and run off because I mentioned contracts, a contract doesn't have to be full of legal jargon. It, a contract is, by definition, a written agreement of what will or won't be done. So you can write your agreement in plain English, and that can be a contract. And your contract, or contracts, you should have probably several different ones for different cases, but your contracts should answer the questions and issues that may arise in your podcast or will arise certain terms and conditions. For example, here are just some questions that you should answer with different contracts, like what do you expect of your co-hosts? 
how do you handle personal information from your audience? Like when they leave comments on your site and you have their IP address or they email you stuff, they might send you a username name and password to something. How are you going to handle that? What promises do you make or not make? How will your money and expenses be handled? This is especially important if you have co-hosts. Who owns what and what are they allowed to do with it? What will you do when something bad happens, like an emergency, some kind of disagreement in the podcast or about how the podcast is run? Someone wants to quit. Someone just isn't doing very well in the podcast. It's not performing like you thought. Whatever the case might be, what will you do when this bad thing happens? And also consider what will you give a sponsor and what will you expect in return? And I really recommend that whatever contracts you make, write them in a kind of a template with an introductory paragraph where you have your overview and definitions. And then that helps make it so that when you need to change that contract for someone else, like maybe you have a different co-host or a different sponsor, whatever the case is, that all you have to change is just that first paragraph or maybe just the first line of the contract. For example, I've got the first uh, paragraph, the overviews and definitions section of my current Noodle Mix Network advertising agreement in the show notes for this episode at theaudacitypodcast.com slash 153. But here's the way it basically reads. Noodle Mix Network, the network, and Daniel J. Lewis, the host, agreed to include promotion for, I'll say, Podcast Masterclass, the sponsor, on the Audacity to Podcast, the show, and the Audacity to Podcast.com, the website, for four episodes in January 2014, the sponsored episodes, at $5 million per episode for a total of $20 million, the rate. <laughs> I'd love that sponsorship. And then... And when you look at this in the show notes, you'll see that some of those things are bold and that bold information is what you would need to change. But then these proper nouns like the host, the network, the sponsored episodes, the rate are the terms that you can use then throughout the contract. Yes, it does make it seem a little less friendly, but it makes it so much easier for you. And most people who would be signing a contract are probably familiar with that kind of thing. But then the rest of your contract can be very simple English. And it doesn't have to be fancy in all of these weird ways of th saying things and tons and tons of commas. But you can write it in plain English and have a contract for these things. Because then you can know and you can come back to something when, when something like this happens. Like if someone just out of the blue decides to give your podcast $1,000, what are you going to do with that? If you have you and your co-host do you split it up 50-50? Do, does it pay for expenses? Do you keep the whole thing? Do you give your co-host 25% and you keep 75%? All of these kinds of things need to be written into your contract. And I have contracts with Noodle Mix Network affiliates as well as Noodle Mix Network co-hosts on what I expect of them and what they expect from me and what I promise and all of this stuff. And I'm, I'm in the process of revising some of these contracts too. But it's always important to have your agreements written down as a form of a contract so that you know what's expected and others will know what's expected and what will happen in certain cases. And this is a way to take your podcasting seriously. Because if you approach a sponsor, this can be a great thing to give them just as part of the sponsorship, the, the package that you let them know or share with them as, hey, we'd love for you to sponsor our podcast, and here's a sample of our contract. And it can have the list of what you provide, what you promise to give, what you expect from them, your terms, payment options, all of that are in your contract. And then they will receive that. They'll know that they're dealing with someone who takes this seriously because you took the time to write that contract. So that's number three, make contracts. And if you need help with writing some contracts, I recommend Gordon Firemark at gfiremark.com. Dot com. He is, I think, the best in this industry because he knows podcasting and he knows plain English too. And I've had him on the Audacity podcast for several episodes before and he was great. I know a lot of you benefited from that. Number four, treat your podcast like a job or a business. Think about even if you're employed by someone else or you're self-employed or you're looking for employment, 
think about how you approach your job. You probably approach it pretty seriously because you know there are pretty big consequences if you aren't serious about your job. Even if you're a clown in a circus, you approach your job with some kind of seriousness. Bring that same level of commitment, focus, and seriousness to your podcast and you'll find it succeed greatly. Certainly the consequences aren't as big if you miss an episode, you're a little late, you don't do as well. That doesn't mean that your family won't be able to make the mortgage payment unless that is how you get your sponsorship money is based on your performance or how it could be the difference between getting a sponsor and not getting a sponsor is how seriously you take your podcast. So just think about the common expectations for employees and how this applies to podcasting. An employer would expect their employee to be on time, to have the skills to do their job well, to know how to use the tools that they're given to do their job, to work nicely with others and with their boss, to meet deadlines that there may be, to serve others, to improve their craft. These and many more expectations are on just about any kind of employee out there. Approach your podcast in this same way. Like I already mentioned, be consistent. That's one of the things. Be on time. You should know how to present your content. Content. Know how to use the tools that you have. Approach your podcast as you are serving others and improve the way you're doing it. Just approach it with that same kind of seriousness as a job or a business. Even if it's a hobby, you can still approach it in the same serious way because Really, look out there at some of the people who are known for their hobbies and are, are, well, professionals in their hobby. They would still say it's their hobby. They love to do it. They get such joy out of it. But they're professionals at it because they take it seriously, even though it's a hobby. A hobby doesn't mean you're not taking it seriously. Uh, you can define a hobby in many different ways, but taking it seriously doesn't mean it has to be a job or a business. But treat it that way and see how that changes your perspective of things. And knowing that if you are a co-host of a podcast, you can't just, five minutes before the episode is supposed to start, you can't just say, "Uh, I don't really feel like podcasting tonight. That's bad employee skills. You can't do that with a boss just to call in when you're supposed to be there and say, I don't really feel like coming in today. I'd rather sit out in the sunshine or I'm just not feeling like working. Sure, there are sick days and all of that, but you know what I mean by this. Treat it like a podcast or treat your podcast like a job or a business and see how that improves how you take it seriously. Number five, invest in your show. I know that amateurs will do, and many of us, even if we're not amateurs, we're trying to be professional, but we'll often try to do things as cheaply as possible or even free if we can. But I think the difference here between an amateur and a professional is a professional recognizes that these expenses aren't just expenses, but they're investments to help them succeed in some way. I know money's tight and This can be initially the most difficult thing to do in order to improve your podcast. And believe me, I'm still very far from rolling in the cash. I podcasting is really fun and I'm seeing new successes with it. And this year is more profitable than last year, but it's still tight. I can't just go out and buy what I want or what I need sometimes. So I still have to be very frugal price hunt and all of this stuff. But where I have spent money on things, I've seen great returns, not always financial returns, but returns with time, with less frustration. It could mean that you invest in better web hosting. Oh, this was so hard for me to do. My web hosting plan that I had before for several years was a shared web hosting plan. I was paying, I think, six or eight dollars ten dollars maybe a month and that was good enough for a while and then we launched our once upon a time podcast and the network started growing more and we started getting a lot more traffic to all of our sites all together every day and simultaneous people visiting the site i just thought 
my my eight dollar hosting plan should be able to cover this you know the whole unlimited thing yeah right it's unlimited until you hit the limit and it was so hard for me to consider spending fifty dollars sixty dollars seventy eighty for a better web hosting server and eventually i had to upgrade to a dedicated server at a hundred and sixty dollars a month just for the server and that was necessary though now i'm back down to 147 dollars because i found a better host that works better with that and that is web synthesis they're expensive but for me they're worth it because of their performance and i've had almost no downtime for my websites since i moved to them and my websites run so much faster on them so for that you know what that saved me it didn't save me money it saved me so much frustration it saved me from so many emails coming in saying your site's down again hey i can't download your episodes your rss feed is broken your whatever it is hey i can't get on the forums i can't this that my email wouldn't work certain times and i get emails from the web hosting company saying you're exceeding your limits on our unlimited service so making that extra investment saves me so much frustration in other ways and now i see that The expenses are being paid a lot by donations, but also this is just part of the overall business because I'm treating podcasts, actually to me, my podcasts are businesses. They're parts of my business. So I run them like businesses. There's their profit agreements and expenses and income reports and all of that stuff that I do for my podcast. Some other things that you could look at as investments for your podcast would be nicer website design or maybe just a better template for your site. Maybe some premium apps or plugins to make things faster or easier for you or your visitors or subscribers. Maybe upgrading your audio or video equipment to improve your quality or hiring some professionals to help you or attending conferences to gain more knowledge and network with other people. By the way, speaking of gaining more knowledge... There are a bunch of awesome opportunities for you to go to different conferences and network with other people and learn more about the craft of podcasting. Like New Media Expo is coming up. I'm speaking on a panel there about how to grow your podcast audience from hundreds to thousands with Dave Jackson and Ray Ortega. And if you'd like to register, go to theaudacitypodcast.com slash NMX and use the promo code Daniel20 to save 20%. There are also podcasts that are usually free, online webinars, often free. Podcasting A to Z from Cliff Ravenscraft is a great place to go if you want to learn how to start podcasting. Use the promo code NOODLE to save a bunch of money off of podcasting A to Z. I also have Podcast Masterclass coming up in February 2014, which I'm really excited about that. Podcast Masterclass is for the podcaster who's already learned how to podcast and they want to make it a whole lot better. It's expensive. Yeah, a lot of these things are expensive, but they're investments to help you succeed. There are also many local meetups. Look online, like at meetup.com and other services like that, lanyard.com, that allow you to find these local meetups and invest in your show, maybe just by buying lunch for yourself and someone else where you can get some of their knowledge and be inspired by them. So, so far we've got number one, plan. Number two, be consistent. Number three, make contracts. Number four, treat your podcast like a job or business. And number five, invest in your show. I've got four more points to share with you, but before I do, I want to tell you about this episode's sponsor, DropCam. DropCam makes this awesome little camera that as its name implies, you pretty much just drop it where you want it and you can start streaming video to the internet. Now, it's more than just live streaming for podcasting or something, but this can be used for security, for surveillance. Maybe you're away from home and you want to set up a camera just to make sure everything's okay. Maybe it's Christmas time and you want to put a camera on the presents to make sure no one goes up and shakes the presents or tries to figure out what they are. Maybe you have a live podcast studio and you want people to get to see an overall like bird's eye view of your whole studio. Maybe you're concerned about the security of your equipment in your studio while you're away traveling. Maybe it's at the office, anything like that. Dropcam makes it so easy because you can set it up in just a few minutes. You just open the box, take the camera out, plug it in, connect it to your Wi-Fi network, Give your camera a name, create your free account, and then you're ready to begin. 
So simple, so quick, and the quality is great too. There are even extra services that you can add to this, like cloud recording. Well, they'll save 720 hours of continuous video footage that you can review at any time. This even works great for social events, like if you're hosting an online conference or if you have family members that aren't able to be with you during the holidays, this is a great opportunity to stick that drop cam up, connect it to the network, and then your family can watch with you and share these special moments. There are two different models, and you got to check this out at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash drop cam. It has so many uses for it. And the quality of this thing is great. It can zoom in. It has a wide angle of view. The um, image quality is great. It even has stuff built in for night vision. So you can have some night vision surveillance. This thing is awesome and affordable too, I think. So check it out at theaudacitytopodcast.com and find out just some of the ways that you could use Dropcam. And I'd love to hear from you other ways that you could use Dropcam. And thank you so much, Dropcam, for sponsoring this episode of the Audacity to Podcast and for helping us out with our Tech Podcast Network coverage of CES. That's what is really cool about Dropcam is how they're helping us with our coverage there. So check them out at theaudacitypodcast.com slash dropcam. So moving on, number six, speak with authority. All broadcasting, no matter whether it's podcasting, television, radio, writing on the internet, it's all about communication. And you not only should communicate clearly, but you need to do so with authority if you want respect from people. Respect for who you are, respect for the content that you share, respect for your professionalism, respect just to come back again and again and consume your content. Speak with authority. Even when you're uncertain about something, you can still speak confidently about what you do know. And it's not a lack of authority to say things like, I think, or from my experience, because if you've spoken with authority in other areas, then when you say, I think this, then it carries more weight because people already know that they trust you in all of these other areas. So when you say you think something, then they'll probably trust you then too, because of the reputation you've built. And you build this by speaking with authority. This is more than just speaking clearly and communicating clearly, but knowing your stuff, knowing it so well that you can teach it in plain English, no matter how complicated it is. I've seen podcasters come and go in, well, competitive spaces, sure, competition with some of my shows. And those who stay and succeed are speaking clearly and with authority. But those who haven't stayed or are struggling to grow their audiences, I do see that they don't really sound like they know their stuff. They are not speaking with authority. They don't know this content very well. They're not speaking it confidently. Even if they're wrong, they're not presenting it in a way that they think they're right and that they think this is the best way to consider. And this isn't about being so stuck up on you are right with this content and There's no way that you could possibly be wrong, but this is about presenting it as you know it and that you know it so well, you can speak with that authority, but be careful with this because if you overdo this, then it will sound like conceit and pride. And if you listen to some of my early episodes of the Audacity to Podcast, I think that you'll hear some of this coming through in the way that I present some of the content. I know that one of my episodes, especially because I went back to review it a few months ago because I wanted to find out what did I say about this particular point. And while I was listening to it, I was rolling my eyes at myself thinking, oh man, will this guy ever stop saying stuff like I'm the only one who's going to give you this, or I am the source of knowledge and inspiration on this topic. And Oh boy, when I can roll my eyes at myself, I know it was pretty bad. And I was trying to overdo it back then. So don't overdo it, but still know your content well. Speak that well. Remember about 
treating this like a job and business, part of that is serving others because you are an employee in a company in order to serve others, whether it be customers or your employers. Think that way with your authority, use your authority to serve. Now think about that. That's pretty deep and speak with authority. So that's number six. Number seven, delegate what you don't do best. No one is truly successful all by themselves. If you look at the most successful people in really any field, I think that you'll be greatly inspired by them, especially when you look at certain details that they have. What I see when I look at these people is they often have big dreams, but not just big dreams. They have a plan to reach those dreams, but also they know how to do what they're good at doing, and they know to get someone else to do what they're not good at doing. Just think about where Apple would be if Steve Jobs tried to do everything and he tried to design every single product that Apple made. It probably wouldn't be there. Imagine if Ford was made, uh, started by a company or started by Henry Ford who wanted to do everything, build every car himself, tighten every screw, all of this stuff all by himself. It'd be insane. He would be insane and he would have never succeeded. Leadership comes in delegating things to other people so they can do what they're good at, you can do what you're good at, and no one is doing anything that they're not good at. Look at the things that you dread in podcasting and consider delegating these things to volunteers, virtual assistants, or employees. This is very similar to my point in last episode about how to make podcasting fun because when you get rid of these things that you dread then it can make podcasting so much more of a positive experience. But don't feel like you're just passing your garbage on to someone else. The task that you might be assigning to someone else could be something that they would love to do. And you may hate to do it. So it's a great fit for you to pass it on to someone else. But I know this can be hard because podcasting can feel like our baby. And you're releasing control over this when you're delegating certain responsibilities to someone else. But if you really want to be serious about what you do, then you need to do those things that you are seriously good at. And that means often releasing the control on the things that you aren't that good at, or just the things that are taking too much time so that you can focus more on those things that will help you succeed a lot more. This is something I've been learning to do more and more with our Once Upon a Time podcast, stuff like writing the show notes or even editing the audio in the podcast that I'm trying to delegate this to other people because I've realized that sometimes the amount of time it takes me to do these things myself prevents me from doing these other things that really are more important or not necessarily more important, but that pay the bills and paying the bills is really important. So I guess those other things are more important than editing a podcast episode or getting it out by a particular time. So look for those things that you can delegate and become a leader to other people so that you can focus on what you do best. Just think about this. If it takes you one hour to edit your podcast and write your show notes after you've already recorded it and you delegate that work to someone else. How much better could your podcast be if you spent that same hour preparing for your next episode or promoting your episode instead? How much better? Think about it. Use that time for something that might matter more to you and grow your audience or help you be more professional, pursue those sponsorship relationships, whatever it may be. Delegate what you don't do best. That's number seven. Number eight, change your vocabulary. I'm going to get a little controversial here, but think hard about the terms you use and what they mean to people. For example, are you really just a blogger or are you a writer? Jeff Goins talks about this a lot, and he was interviewed a couple times actually on Beyond the To-Do List, hosted by Eric Fisher, which is part of the Noodle Mix Network. Check it out, beyondthetodolist.com. But Jeff has talked about these things of, well, be a writer. Don't just be a blogger. Be a writer. It's it's a different 
perspective on what you do, that you're not just blogging, which is short for weblog, and it started with people who wanted to keep an online journal, but be a writer. Treat yourself as a writer. See yourself as a writer. Another way to think about this is with your podcast, do you just talk about movies with your friend or are you a film critic? Are you a podcaster who might have the give the impression that you're in your basement all by yourself talking to almost no one or are you an internet broadcaster okay i know i know what you're probably thinking that i'm trying to kill the word podcast no i'm not but this is more than just fancy titles like smile specialist or something weird like that think about what your title and what you believe about your title reflects on your work If you tell someone that you are a podcaster, then you have to try to explain that. And then they might think it's just you in your basement. The impressions that come along with that, you know that. But if you say you're an internet broadcaster, well, they'll probably understand a lot better right away what you're talking about. They won't have that instant reaction of, oh, I don't have an iPod, so I'm not interested in that. But then they think, ooh, you're an internet broadcaster. Whoa. And you can tell them about that. Like I might say to someone who asks what I do, I might say, I host a weekly audio show about how others can get into internet broadcasting for their business or personal goals. Notice I didn't use the word podcast at all in that description. Podcasting is actually a technical description of just one particular kind of media distribution. I have a video edition of the Audacity to Podcast and that's at theaudacitypodcast.com slash iTunes video or slash YouTube. Well, there's the thing. It's on YouTube too. So on that show, I don't say it's a podcast. I don't say welcome to the podcast or anything like that. I do say welcome to the Audacity to Podcast because that's the title. But it's a show. Being on YouTube does not make you a podcaster. A podcast is a technical description of something, and that is downloadable media media syndicated in an RSS feed, which stands for Rich Site Summary, or some people call it really simple syndication. That's a podcast. So do you want to be known as a YouTuber, a, <laughs> a video podcaster, or an internet TV show host, or something else? And I'll give you a little hint. None of these really apply accurately. Don't look at limiting yourself to a particular media distribution method when you tell people what you are or what you do. But look at the broad sense of this. What will they understand? And what title can you give yourself that helps you take this more seriously? If you think of yourself as an internet broadcaster, Well, the impression I get immediately when I think of broadcaster is I'm thinking of a news anchor, people who have been there to share the news during the good times, the bad times. They've been there as icons of hope at times and as authorities on certain areas. That can apply to you in your podcast as well. And you may change that perspective if you start realizing you're not just a podcaster, but you are an internet broadcaster. Do you publish on YouTube? That's not a podcast. Do you live stream on the internet while you're recording? Like I do for the Audacity to podcast, I live stream it. That's not a podcast while I'm live streaming it. If you are on Stitcher, well, for a while, Stitcher has only streamed audio. They wouldn't allow it to be downloaded. Now they're starting to do this new download option, which is great. But on Stitcher, it wouldn't technically be a podcast because it isn't It wasn't downloadable. Now it is downloadable and it is powered by RSS feeds, sure. But the way that the user gets the content is usually by streaming. So don't limit yourself just by a particular media distribution, but look at what you do. You are creating content and you have the guts to do it in a different way. And that is by podcasting, by distributing your content on the internet or by broadcasting it on the internet in whatever way that you do it. So look at ways that you can change your vocabulary to approach your content more seriously. And number nine, never stop improving. Have you achieved perfection? (laughs) No, I haven't either. Podcasting is something that, like anything else, 
will involve ongoing work if you really want to take it seriously. Husbands, just think about how would your marriage go if after you got married, you thought, okay, I got her. Now I can stop wooing her. I can stop dating her. I can stop trying to win her heart. I have arrived. I've gotten married. I don't need to do anything else to win my wife's affections. Where would that marriage go? Yeah, it would not succeed because that would be a husband who's not taking their marriage seriously. And husbands, seriously, take your marriage seriously. Think about like a concert pianist too. They don't just stop with a single piece, even if they feel they've perfected that piece or other people say you have perfected that piece. They will still work on it and continue working on it more and more because this is a really deep concept that will sound very mystical, but it's not intended that way, even though I learned it from karate. But in karate, we do these things called katas, and it's basically a visual ordered representation of technique. And you could call it a dance. Some people call it a form, but it's a performance of these different techniques. And I remember my sensei once saying that when you master the kata, when you have fully uh, learned how to do the kata, the kata will start to teach you. It like, sounds really mystical, but it's not really because think about this. A concert pianist, let's take it back to there. A concert pianist works on a piece and they work hard and hard and hard. Then when they feel like they may have almost perfected that piece, they start to learn from the piece certain things, certain things about music theory, certain things about technique that they're doing and what sounds better that they do in certain areas, how to breathe better in certain sections. The piece is teaching them after they've learned how to do that piece. It sounds mystical, but it's not. It's where they have not stopped improving. And then a really good concert pianist doesn't stop with just one piece. They pick up something else to start producing. They don't go from just one success to another. They don't go from just one success and stop. They go from success to success to success to failure to success to success and just keep building on it. This was a question that I raised to John Lee Dumas in our Podcasters Roundtable number 22, which watch for that at podcastersroundtable.com. Longest episode ever, but so much great content in there. And one of the questions I asked John Lee Dumas is, now that he's making so much money from just his podcast, why is he doing these other things? Why is he getting into certain online services and communities and stuff? Hasn't he arrived? And I I ask this knowing kind of what his perspective would be, but I wanted to still raise this question as I know many people out there might be thinking, and I can be tempted to feel this as well. It's like... Stop, come on, leave some success for the rest of us. Totally wrong perspective. And I struggle with that sometimes. But his answer was that he wanted to keep improving. He wants to keep growing and keep serving more people and focusing on this awesome passion and providing meeting needs that he's had in his own professional life. Definitely watch for that episode over at podcastersroundtable.com. It will be round 22. So this list of nine ways to take podcasting seriously, number one, plan. Number two, be consistent. Number three, make contracts. Number four, treat your podcast like a job or a business. Number five, invest in your show. Number six, speak with authority. Number seven, delegate what you don't do best. Number eight, change your vocabulary. And number nine, never stop improving. It's on this point of never stop improving. Why I created Podcast Masterclass. I wanted a class for podcasters to not just teach them about how to podcast, but how to podcast so much better. And that's why Podcast Masterclass is only for current podcasters. There is no how do I start a podcast information in Podcast Masterclass. None of that at all. Nothing like what kind of microphone should I get? Or how do I connect a mixer? Or do I need a mixer? Anything like that. This is the stuff beyond, like you could say beyond the A to Zs out there. This is how to really take your podcast to new heights, to podcast from average to amazing. That's what Podcast Masterclass is all about. 
And it's for those people who want to take their podcast seriously and are willing to make that investment of time because it will take a lot of time through the class. It's a month-long class that will have a couple sessions per week. There will be some rough knocks on your podcast possibly as we review things and actually tell you, you know, this is where you could improve. This is where you're doing it great, but you really need to work on this and this is horrible, anything like that. Some brutal honesty will come out, but it will be a great time, I think, to really help podcasters succeed in what they're doing. And I'm offering an exclusive promo code to listeners of Podcast Masterclass. If you sign up with promo code TAP listener at podcastmasterclass.com, you will save big on it. Now, here's the way this promo code works. I know I said one way previously, but here's the way this is going to work. If you use this promo code by visiting podcastmasterclass.com, T-A-P listener, then the uh, two months before the class, so our next class is coming up in February, this will be through December, two months before, $400 off. The month before... The first half of the month before, $300 off. And then the last couple weeks before the class, $200 off the class. So check that out at podcastmasterclass.com and use the promo code TAP listener to register for that. I'm really excited for it. I got a response from someone who has already registered for it and he is thrilled about it and really looking forward to it. And Already, he can't wait for the class to come, and I'm really excited about this too and looking forward to it. It will be in February 2014. Sessions will be recorded, and that's at podcastmasterclass.com if you'd like to find out more information about that. But always look for ways that you can improve your content, your presentation, and your production. Take your podcast seriously. I'd love to hear from you. What are some ways that you are taking your podcast seriously? Or if you want to share without naming anybody, some ways that you see others not taking their podcast seriously and how you think that's hurting them. I'd love to hear your response to this information by commenting in the show notes at theaudacitypodcast.com slash 153. If you'd like to send me feedback and suggestions for future episodes of The Audacity to Podcast, email feedback at theaudacitypodcast.com or call and leave a voicemail at 903-231-2221. You can also send a voice message through the website at theaudacitytopodcast.com. I have just two quick announcements for you. New Media Expo is coming up in less than a month. Register at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash NMX and use the promo code DANIEL20 to save 20% off any registration over there. And also, I really would love to see your podcast promoted in front of tens of thousands of people by helping to participate in our crowdfund campaign for our tech podcast coverage of the Consumer Electronics Show. And you can find out more information about that at tpn.tv slash crowdfund. And it will be an excellent opportunity to grow your audience by promoting that and to help us do something really cool. And we've got some great bonuses and benefits for you if you join that crowdfund. That's at tpn.tv slash crowdfund. So I hope that from this information, you'll learn to take your podcast seriously, even if you're doing it just as a hobby and you're talking about video games or movies or whatever it is, take it seriously with all of these points. You can get the show notes and comment. Let me know what you thought and your experience at the audacity to podcast.com slash 153. Big thanks to Dropcam for sponsoring this episode. Check them out at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash dropcam and get high definition streaming of your home, office, or anywhere for security, for family, or just about anything that you have in mind. Check it out, theaudacitytopodcast.com slash dropcam. Now that I've given you some of the guts and taught you some of the tools, it's time for you to go podcast with passion, organization, and dialogue. I'm Daniel J. Lewis from the audacity to podcast.com. Thank you so much for listening. The 
Audacity to Podcast is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts 